America seems more disunited than at any point in recent history. Its politics undermined by partisan divisions, consensus on almost anything impossible to achieve. So what's weakened the bonds that once held this huge democracy together? And where could the discord lead? In the first of two special reports, Bob Apesaps has been to investigate. America today is a house divided, not by slavery, which Abraham Lincoln warned would lead to the U.S. Civil War of the 1860s, but by toxic partisanship between Democrats and Republicans, the nation's two main parties. I'm angry at Democrats because of what they do to our country. Right now, we have people in Congress that hate our country. We have a president intentionally, purposely, is trying to divide us up by the color of our skin, by our gender. The Republicans have become complicit in bringing down the character of the United States. President Trump keeps destroying and gnawing at that character. And our Republican friends, they just shrug their shoulders. Partisan rancor has worsened since the release this year of special counsel Robert Mueller's report on his investigation of President Trump and Russian interference in the 2016 presidential race. I appreciate very much what Mr. Mueller did for the country. I have read most of the report. For me, it is over. Republicans believe that the Mueller report cleared Trump. The real scandal, they claim, is that the FBI spied on his campaign. Has the FBI ever launched a counterintelligence investigation of another president that you're aware of? Not to my knowledge. That's the real crisis here. If this can go on in the United States of America, we don't have a democracy anymore. Democrats counter that Mueller's report provides ample evidence that the president obstructed justice and committed other misdeeds that warrant his impeachment. We took an oath to protect and serve the Constitution of the United States of America. And the way we do that is we begin impeachment proceedings now. Each side is so convinced that they are absolutely correct, that they are morally and truly correct, and that the other side is dangerous. Liliana Mason is a professor at the University of Maryland. Her recent book, Uncivil Agreement, examines why partisan polarization and incivility are so extreme now in the United States. Trump isn't the cause of a lot of the discord that we're seeing. He probably makes it worse. Uh, but, but one of the things he has done is actually to bring out into the open these divides that have been accumulating between the parties. So you argue that the Democrats and Republicans represent two mega identities today. We've seen a process of what I call social sorting. And what that means is that but basically between the 1960s and now, the parties have grown more socially distinct from each other. The Republican Party has become largely white, Christian, rural, somewhat more male, and the Democratic Party is sort of everyone else. And so it starts to feel like every election isn't just about our parties competing, it's about our racial groups and our religious groups and our geographical groups. And if you lose, it's not just your party that lost, it's all of these things that make up your individual identity, all the groups that you feel attached to. It's almost like they've all lost too. This sorting of people into two political camps fuels stereotyping and distrust. In a 2018 poll by Nielsen, 70% of Republicans and 60% of Democrats agreed that the opposing party is a serious threat to the United States. As we become more socially distinct as partisans, it's a lot easier to dehumanize the other group. And so we start to think of the other side as um, not only opponents, but actually enemies and, and dangerous. Why is the rise of partisan mega-identities a threat to democratic norms? Well, the Constitution wasn't written for parties. If you care only about whether your party wins or loses and you care about nothing else, then there is no governing, there is no accountability, there's no impeachment. The only thing that matters is beating the other side and being winners again. In order to investigate political division in the U.S., what Americans think about toxic partisanship and where it's taking the country, 
we headed to North Carolina. The state is a hotbed of partisan conflict. North Carolina is ground zero when it comes to polarization, and that's been true for decades now. Rob Christensen is a political author and reporter who worked at the Raleigh News and Observer for 45 years. The problem trying to figure out the state for the strategists is that the state's not one thing, it's many things. So it has a little bit of Alabama in it, the state has a little bit of Silicon Valley in it, the state has a little bit of Berkeley in it, the state has a little bit of Harlem in it. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting mix and, and a very volatile mix. In 2020, the Republican National Convention will be held in North Carolina, underscoring the state's importance in the presidential race. North Carolina has been very, very close in almost every presidential election in the recent decades. Barack Obama carried North Carolina in 2008, but it was the smallest margin of any state he carried. And so the closeness of races means both parties think they can win. In one day, we are going to win the great state of North Carolina. In 2016, Donald Trump campaigned hard in North Carolina and won it by three and a half points. Donald Trump was in part a backlash against Barack Obama. I think there was just total shock and unacceptance by some substantial minority of the population to see a black man as president of the United States. In 2007, whites in the U.S. were just as likely to identify with Democrats as Republicans. But whites fled the party during Obama's presidency. By 2016, there was a difference of 15 percentage points. Do you think race is at the core of polarization in North Carolina and the nation as a whole? Race is certainly a very, very powerful issue, and we haven't yet come to grips with it. North Carolina played an important role in the American Civil Rights Movement. In 1960, four African-American college students in Greensboro sat down at a white-only lunch counter at a Woolworths department store to order coffee. They were arrested, sparking a lunch counter sit-in that lasted for six months. So how old were you when you participated in the Greensboro City? I was 19 years old. A student had been at college, and we had just gotten the word that... Yvonne Johnson picketed at Woolworths and sat at the counter herself. She currently serves on the Greensboro City Council. When the four guys sat down here, we were so excited. I mean, it was an opportunity to get rid of some of that injustice that we had been experiencing all our lives. What was life like for African Americans here in North Carolina in 1960? I'm the product of segregated schools, segregated waiting rooms, colored and white water fountains sitting in the back of the bus. So it was, it was horrible. It was terrible. How did the Woolworth sit-in come to an end? It came to an end when the mayor and the powers that be got together and they began to open businesses to African Americans, restaurants and facilities to us. And it spread like wildfire, this nonviolent tactic that could work. The Woolworth sit-in was a catalyst for a youth-led sit-in movement that helped create momentum for the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Moderate Democrats led the fight for the legislation, setting the stage for the racial sorting between the parties that we see today. I do date this back to the mid-1960s when the Democratic Party chose to be the party of civil rights. Um, that really angered a huge portion of the people who identified as Democrats, namely white Southern Democrats. The change was gradual for some people, but it helped pull away a lot of conservative Democrats into the Republican Party. And they started voting for people like George Wallace, who was a Democrat, although he ran at some point as a third party candidate. And then, essentially, they began crossing over into voting for Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan or Donald Trump today. This has happened all across the South, dividing up along racially polarized lines. But, you know, that's true nationally. A good example of this racial shift between the parties took place in Lenore County, North Carolina. There were once plantations with slaves here, and in Kinston, there is a replica of a Confederate gunship in the center of town. At the visitor center, we met up with Mike Parker, the commander of the local chapter of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. All of us are descendants of Confederate soldiers. More men died in the Civil War than died in all the other wars we've ever fought put together. Down here, it involved almost every family. And this is one reason, I think, why in the South, the Civil War is such a big deal. There are about 800 Sons of Confederate Veterans chapters across the American South. How big a battle was it here? The lines went on for several miles. Two bloody Civil War battles were fought in Kinston. 
Are you concerned about the divisions in American society today? Yes, I'm concerned because it shows a tremendous lack of open-mindedness and respect. Down here, is there a racial split between the parties? I would say most African Americans are registered as Democrats, and probably two-thirds of white voters are registered as Republicans. So that's a shift from years past, right? Yes. Do you think that racial tensions got worse as a result of President Obama being elected to the presidency? It's too easy to just say, well, he was a black man, therefore white people didn't like him. Um, there, are, there are people who just say, look, we don't want socialism. We don't want these huge government programs. But I think Obama also put in, you know, he constantly seemed to me to play a race card. What race card do you think he played? I think he played a card, I think he played the black card. Do you support President Trump? I support him on many things. I think his economic policies are sound. I think his position on trying to secure our borders is sound. And Parker supported President Trump's response to an August 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Trump equated white supremacist organizers with protesters who came to confront them. You should be ashamed of yourself. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. The rally was organized to protest the removal of a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Violence erupted, leaving more than 30 injured and a counter-protester dead. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. He wasn't talking about there being good people among the white supremacist and Klan. There were a lot of other people who were there that were defending that monument. Who were the good people that were there defending the monument? I'm sure that there were some people who were just history buffs. I mean, not everybody who thinks the monument should, should stay where they are is a racist. One doesn't need to be racist in order to uh, still be okay with a system that systematically oppresses non-white groups. And that's what's affiliated with the Republican Party. It's not that everyone in the party is a racist, it's that the party is not interested in addressing any type of systemic racism. White voters without a college degree flocked to Trump in the 2016 election. Partisan tensions are heightened by the fact that white Americans are expected to become a minority within the next 30 years. So that's a huge factor. There is a sense of threat that white Americans feel um, about that. And ultimately, it's going to create a situation in which Republican candidates are going to have a much harder time winning elections. And so they really have two options. One is to reach out to racial minorities or to rig the system. In fact, Republican attempts to rig the system are also fueling political anger. In North Carolina, it started when Republicans won both houses of the state legislature in 2010. They have chose to focus on passing laws that make it easier to get a gun than it is to vote. Republicans pushed through a new voter ID law and redrew election districts in their favor. It provoked a fierce backlash, the Moral Monday movement led by the Reverend William Barber II, then head of the North Carolina NAACP. If you seek to divide us, and play games with us, it'll only bring us closer together. Last May, Reverend Barber was back at the state capitol, supporting teachers who had come to pressure legislators for more education funding. Why did you launch the Moral Monday movement? Because the legislature, in the first 13 days of that, getting here in 2013, they attacked everybody, from the teachers to the poor to the sick. Then they attacked voting rights. They knew that voter ID would hurt minorities, women, and students. But it wasn't just voter ID. They wanted to roll back same-day registration, early voting. They didn't even want 17 and 18-year-olds to pre-register to vote. This was an all-out war on the ballot. The NAACP mounted a legal challenge to the Republican voter ID law. In 2016, federal appeals court judges struck it down, saying the law was designed to target African Americans with almost surgical precision. We won. We won on voter suppression. And the people found out that even that you don't just have to wait until there's an electoral season. But this past December, North Carolina Republicans passed another voter ID law. The NAACP and other voting rights advocates are challenging it again in court. Do you think race is at the core of division in America today? 
racism is always in play in, in, in a, this country. But the problem is how we talk about racism. We tend to talk about racism when something like Charlottesville happened, which is a form of ugly, vile racism, or racism when somebody calls somebody an ugly name. But the racism that is deadly in terms of the long-term health of the country is systemic racism. The kind of racism people can actually shake your hand, look at you, never call you the N-word, but when they're sitting in office, they pass racist voter suppression. The Republican Senate leader and House Speaker in North Carolina declined our request for interviews. Nationwide, 25 states have made it harder to vote since 2010, and 15 passed voter ID laws claiming it's needed to combat voter fraud. Democrats say the claims of fraud are an excuse to suppress the vote and have introduced legislation in Congress to stop it. We heard loud and clear from the American people that they want to be able to get to the ballot box without having to run an obstacle course. We have this 50-50 politics in which elections can really depend on a few thousand votes here or there. And both sides have come to believe the electoral system is not legitimate. On the Republican side, it's voter fraud. On the Democratic side, it's voter suppression. Lee Drutman is a senior fellow in the political reform program at New America. His book, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, will be released later this year. What I call a doom loop is a way of describing a a kind of reinforcing feedback loop that keeps getting worse and worse over time. Uh, and partisan polarization is like that because once the parties distrust each other more, which then justifies more and more aggressive actions and the rhetoric inflames upon itself, and you get to this point where, where the, you, you've created this unbridgeable chasm. Manipulating the boundaries of an electoral district to ensure it has a majority of voters favoring a party, what's known as gerrymandering, also fuels partisan distrust gerrymandering, uh, which Republicans have been particularly aggressive in the last decade, creates the sense that whatever the outcome, somebody cheated. In 2018, Republican candidates for Congress in North Carolina got 50.39 percent of the vote, but won 10 of the state's 13 congressional seats. Last March, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a case challenging Republican gerrymandering in the state. Republicans in North Carolina rigged the maps to create safe seats so they could ignore the will of the people. But in June, the court's Republican-appointed majority ruled against the effort to rein in partisan gerrymandering. Every indicator shows America to be the least well-functioning democracy of any established democracy. Andrew Reynolds, a professor at the University of North Carolina, helped develop the standards used to measure election quality around the world. They're using computerized maps to literally draw lines around one-way streets and, and, and tiny little houses in farm country. You can pick out every house you want to be in a district. What you're doing is you're just making sure your party can almost never lose that district. So the real contest is not in the general election, but in the primary contest where candidates vie to be the nominee of the party favored by the gerrymander. When you create safe seats, the Democrats appeal to the extremes of the Democratic Party, the Republicans ex appeal to the extremes of the Republican Party. If districts required you to appeal to the moderate center, then we would see very different type of Republicans being elected. But when you draw a district that relies upon the primary, then they're going to rally the faithful with dog whistles, with racism, with homophobia, um, with behaviors that create fearfulness about the other, the Mexican coming in, the Latino. I want a wall. That's what we saw in Lenore County. Trump needs allies to help shoot down these socialist radical agenda. In a Republican primary for a safe congressional seat, candidates were trying to outdo each other as diehard conservatives. Kymer Clark is pro-life, pro-gun, and pro-wall. With the radical left cheering late-term abortion and infanticide, I felt called to defend our most vulnerable children. Viewpoints on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. Okay, today is voting day, and you have until 7.30 to go to the polls, so... Uh, on primary day for the House seat, conservative talk radio host Lockwood Phillips was filling the airwaves with calls to turn out and vote. There's been a lot of discussion, of course, by all the candidates supporting the president. His radio station was the first in the state to air right-wing radio host Rush Limbaugh and is an affiliate of Fox, President Trump's favorite news outlet. Is President Trump popular in this part of the state? 
Absolutely. Because he's not part of the ruling elite class that we in North Carolina and many blue collar voters perceive Washington, D.C. has become. Are you concerned about the hyper-partisanship in America today? Yes, it's removed a willingness on the part of local voters and participants to sit down and talk and identify the problems that they have at their immediate community. Do you think that race is at the root of the hyper-partisanship today? No. You don't? No. We have racial issues in this country, but they are being solved. The problem is you've got folks in certain quarters, and I have to say liberal quarters, who don't want that solution because it's a great way to keep the community stirred up. You know, if you take the Confederate statue issue or you take Black Lives Matter, it's that people today are raising new issues and they want them to be addressed. I appreciate that. They want to be addressed, but for what purpose? It's identity politics. If you have an agenda, the first thing requirement is you must become a victim. You must have an identity. What about a white identity? After President Obama, there was a shift of like 15 points of white folks into the Republican Party. Your point is, I'm, I'm missing that. Identity politics encompass more than just democratic identity politics, right? There's a Republican identity politics. Oh, arguably, yes, there's no question. So what do you feel is driving hyper-partisanship today? The real issue, and I've got it in my hand and I want to display it, is this device. The digital environment has oxymoronically, counterintuitively, shut down the communications because what happens is people go into their echo chambers. What about some of the material that comes off of Fox? I mean, it's pretty inflammatory, right? I don't know what you call it inflammatory. It's insightful. They are simply providing the information. We begin tonight with a Fox News alert. The witch hunt is officially over. The Mueller report is out and the president of the United States has been totally and completely vindicated. Essentially, what people do when confronted with information that they don't want to be true is they find a lot of ways to argue against it. And one thing that helps is to be given a list of those counterarguments. And often, if you turn to partisan media, they'll tell us all the reasons that, that the true thing is not true. And then we get our answer, we feel satisfied, and we, and we can move on. There's very little objectivity. So what we end up doing is we maximize our differences which in many places are moderate at best. Are you concerned about the divisions in America today? Do you think they're worse than in the past? I think that the 60s was about like today. You know, there was an awful lot of unrest, so I don't think it's necessarily more, but I think today we minimize the things that we have in common. As far as I know, everybody believes in free speech. Everybody believes in freedom of the press. Everybody believes in due process of law. I'm not sure President Trump believes in a due process of law. Look what, what the Mueller report shows. Mueller's report basically said there was nothing that rose to the level of crime. It was pretty obvious. There was no effort on the part of uh, Trump to use the Russians or the Russians to use Trump. Have you talked about obstruction on your radio show? No. Well, it's come up once or twice. It's, again, something that um, it's in the eyes of the beholder, quite frankly. The Mueller report is a Rorschach test for pure partisan politics. If you're a Democrat, you think that there's got to be something criminal in there. If you're a Republican, you think that Trump is, is exonerated. Do you think race and identity are the central dividing line in American politics today? Yeah, the two parties are fundamentally split over race and identity. Race and identity is the the, the core dividing line in American partisan politics today. We had a divisive period in the 1960s, but those divisions cut across the two parties. There were racial liberals in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, so there was a forum for working out those divisions within the parties as challenging as they were. Now those divisions are amplified and reverberated through electoral politics because we have a two-party system and it forces people to get into one camp or the other. So I think if we had partisan polarization that was purely sectional, North versus South, as we did in the 1850s, we would be on the verge of civil war right now. Next week, the schisms over immigration and religion tearing America apart.